You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. With $7.5 billion being invested by the federal government in EV charging infrastructure, it's important to ask some basic questions like how many chargers will we need, when, where, and what type. First off, I just read the first line of a new EV report developed by the Fuels Institute. That's also going to be the topic of our conversation today. Welcome to Convenience Matters. My name is Jeff Leonard with Nax, and today I'm joined by the Executive Director of the Fuels Institute, John Eichberger, also a frequent host on Convenience Matters. So you know the drill. Welcome, John, and let's get right started, uh, started right away. And the last time we talked about EVs a few months ago, the focus was on life cycle emissions. How does this fit into the previous study that the Fuels Institute did and any of those before then? There's been a series of reports we've been doing. We're trying to provide insights to the market so that we can develop an infrastructure that supports a lower carbon mobility situation in a way that is consumer friendly, consumer centric. There's a lot of hype being talked about in the media, a lot of new reports coming out, a lot of political statements being made about where we need to go, how we need to get there. We need to electrify everything. We need half a million chargers by 2030. You know, 50% of all sales in 2030 will be electric. And all that stuff is interesting and great cocktail fodder, but the reality is much more complicated. And so what we're trying to do with our, our life cycle assessment report, our evaluation of EV charger policies and how effective they've been over time, and this newest report on charger deployment optimization is provide some more granular insights so that we can make long-term strategic decisions that – benefit the environment, at the same time, work in the market and benefit consumers. So um, there's a series. We've got a few more coming out here by before the end of 2022 that are designed the same way to help open up the dialogue so that we can be much more thoughtful and strategic about our solutions. Because we've when we started the fuels, it's almost 10 years ago now, um, we started with this theory that you know, if a solution is not sustainable from an economic and long-term perspective, it's going to fail. If it imposes some burden of convenience or cost on the consumer, it's going to fail. And so we need to keep the consumer mind in uh, top of mind as we build our strategies. Otherwise, the strategies will not be successful. And so our, our research is trying to help support that. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we've long talked about when you and I would work together on fuels issues. You always stressed, we are for the consumer. We are the endpoint uh, con- retailers, the endpoint. Th- we're the conduit with with customers. So while there can be some very thoughtful uh, policy decisions that that are considered. It really comes down to understanding the consumer and understanding how retailers play a role. And we've both talked to retailers who have said, look, you know, EVs are coming. No question. We're building for that. But we're also building for a future where we see that that people will be using internal combustion engines for the next 30, 40 years. And, and you take them in tandem as you move forward. So this report is just another in a series of looking how you do that. And it, it's fairly timely in all those news uh, forecasts or re- reports that, that you've uh, mentioned. California is mentioned uh, by the year 2035. 100% of all new cars will be electric. Now, we'll set that aside for now. And we'll just say, hey, you know, it's a really timely discussion because this is dominating the news in terms of how do you see um, what the future is for mobility. And, 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 you know, and let's you, just you opened, you, you opened up this the, the program referring to the federal investment of seven and a half billion dollars. Now we commissioned this before that bill was finalized, but we knew it was coming. Um, we think if you're investing taxpayer dollars, we have to do it so efficiently and effectively. We have to deliver an end product that benefits the the public good. And how we deploy the, those resources, where we install chargers, and what kinds we, we install to get the most bang for our buck is much more important now that we're using taxpayer dollars. 
Um, when you're using your own money, you can you can do a couple things. You can try a couple things that you think are cool and unique. But when you're using the taxpayer dollars, you need to be so responsible with that. And we're hopeful that this study provides some insight so that that money is invested and delivers the greatest value to society it possibly can. Otherwise, it's a real dereliction of duty. That's a great point. And that's a great way to set up the discussion. So where are we on current demand? And what are some of the projections for EV growth over the next few years? We're probably about, I think it's a one and a half million vehicles on the road to have a plug. Um, through July of 2022, 5% of all vehicle, light vehicle sales in the U.S. were battery electric. Um, that does not include the plug-in hybrid, I don't believe. i got to look at the data again, but it's right, right around 5%. So it's a big jump. We we're at 25 2.9% last year. So pretty good jump through the first seven months of this year. <clears throat> the problem is you've got some supply chain problems. I've talked to some friends who've been trying to buy an EV and they're on a nine month waiting list to get delivery. You've got most of the manufacturers have had to increase the retail price of their vehicle to accommodate supply chain and battery costs not going down as fast as they they thought they would. You've got some manufacturers eliminating the lowest level EV because it's not economical for them to manufacture them. And so you've got some headwinds and, you know, your strong advocates think everything's rosy and, and the, the road's all downhill and you're just going to gain momentum, keep gaining momentum and hit these big milestones. We're going to hit big milestones and the momentum is accelerating and there's a ton of exciting new vehicles coming on the road um, that we can choose from and they're in the body styles people want to buy. And so it's a much more attractive market than it was even two years ago, but it is still a challenge. Um, you know, the new Inflation Reduction Act changes the qualification for tax credit. I was talking to a friend of mine who's an, who works for an automaker. He said, John, we've analyzed it. In 2024, unless significant change happens, only three electric vehicles will qualify for the tax credit. Three. That's it. And this was supposed to encourage and help build the market, it has actually, it could have a massive negative effect on consumer affordability of these vehicles. Um, so that's a big challenge. Now, you asked about the future. You've got a couple big global consulting firms came out in the last year or so saying that half of all vehicles sold in 2030 in the United States will be electric. I really disagree. I think that it does not take into consideration the uncertainties of the market. It's not taking into consideration what would happen if there is a global recession <clears throat> what happens if inflation stays at 9, 10%? What happens if electric vehicle prices don't come down like we projected them to? What happens if the war in Russia and Ukraine continues and we don't have access to certain raw materials we need for the batteries and the, the, the different things? So much uncertainty, so much unknown that to put forth a forecast that half of them will be is completely irresponsible in my opinion. We don't know what will be. We know the market's going to grow. Our report here was written by S&P Global Mobility, and they recently merged with IHS Market. So we originally contracted with them. IHS Market has owned vehicle registration data for decades. They're the go-to for vehicle on the road information. In order to do an analysis of how many chargers we need, they first had to do a forecast of how many vehicles are going to be in the market. Their forecast, which I think is is much more conservative than we've seen, I still think it's pretty assertive, um, calls for about 2.8 million elect plug-in vehicles to be sold in 2030, which would be about 16, 17% of vehicles. So a three-fold increase over today. Of, of new um, vehicles. Of new vehicles. vehicles right, because on the road, that, that's, only, that's only one hundredth of all vehicles. So if we keep that sales rate, and everybody drives their car for 100 years, in 100 years, we'll be all EV. Right. So there's headwinds. We got 300 million units in the, in, the, in the United States. Their forecast is 18 million of those will be electric in 2030, which is 6%. And so, you know, for your, the primary audience of convenience matters in the fuel retailing space, 6% market share in the next eight years will be electric. And some of those will be plug-in hybrid not, in my opinion, a disruptive situation. Mm -hmm. It is leading that way. We're, we're, we're going to see EVs have a huge role in the market, 
but it's just it's the same thing we've been talking about for years. It's going to take time. And aspirations are great, and aspirational forecasts are interesting, but we need to take it with a major grain of salt because they're just forecasts, and we don't know what the uncertainties are going to play out. And and we've talked, and I think people have read news reports that that talk about where. EVs are being purchased now. And, and obviously, California is a hotbed <clears throat> for it. And the East Coast as well. It, it right now tends to be a coastal thing. And I saw I saw a story yesterday where somebody said, you know, don't even drive through West Virginia because there's it's difficult to, to, <laughs> to charge your vehicle. Now, that is not a professional recommendation. That's reciting a news article. But, <laughs> um, you know, you do have these these pockets right now that that are heavier in EVs, and, and that will obviously change over time. That's also something the report looked at, right? Yeah. So, you know, again, using the vehicle registration data, um, in July of 2021, 82% of all electric vehicles in the United States were registered in 15 states. Now, California led at 41% of market share. Then you've got, you know, four and a half and five and a half in Texas and Florida, respectively, New York at 4.3%. And then you got a scattering. Um, now, you would think that makes sense. These are zero emission vehicle regulated states. A lot of them, they're the largest states, the most population. So you're going to be selling vehicles where the people are. Um, but you would think with the influx of new vehicles coming on, the distribution of vehicles would get more geographically balanced. It does a little bit. The forecast through 2030 is 76% of all EVs will be in 15 states. Now, significant changes. California is going to go from 41% market share to 25. Oregon and Washington won't even rank in the top 15 states. And you're going to have Florida and Texas at the 8% mark. So you're going to see some shifting, but you're still going to have massive sections of this country that are going to be representing you know, less than 15% or less than 25% of all EVs in the market. And so when we start thinking about where do we need to put chargers, you got to put the chargers in two places. You got to put chargers where the EVs are, where demand is. You have to put chargers where the EVs are going to drive. And so part of the NEVI program is to create a national infrastructure and network so that a driver of an electric vehicle knows they'll be able to get charging whenever they drive. They may mm-hmm. have to be strategic about it and plan ahead, but they're going to be able to get electricity wherever they're going to. And the other part is filling in the communities. Our study really looked at a census track level, which is about as granular as you can get. It looked at a variety of factors to understand at that level of community, what's the charger demand and what do we need? And start optimizing where we really need to focus our attention. And that's going to be critical because we want to build the infrastructure to support the drivers in a way that's economic, responsible, and sustainable. And understanding where the vehicles are and where the vehicles going to be driven is going to be critical to doing that. And that's more than just saying, well, let's just put a lot, of Cal- lot in California. Let's put a lot in Texas. Let's put a lot in Florida. Let's put a lot in, in wherever else EVs are. It's also the type of place that you might want to find it. And I assume there's a difference between... Uh, a neighborhood and a, a a highway or interstate or something like that where somebody from California wants to go somewhere else you have to allow that to happen otherwise the EV has limited value and that's also something that you have to take into account in terms of current and future projections and understanding what level of charger we need at different locations lays right into the economic responsibility and that business ROI, that sustainability from an economic perspective, because you can go out and put in, and, and one of the challenges with the NEVI program is any site that's going to qualify for the grant has to have 600 kilowatts of charging power. That is a lot. A Whole Foods grocery store runs on 400 kilowatts. So you put that in concept. I've spoken with some utilities who say, look, we've got site hosts who want to put in chargers we are 18 months before we can even consider bringing power to their site that's sufficient. And so you're running into a lot of problems. In the study, what S&P Global did is they really analyzed some cell phone ping data to find out where people spend their time. And what they determined was if we were to strategically place level two chargers, which are much lower cost, much slower to charge, but you install them in opportunity zones, 
where people are going to be leaving their car for a couple hours and you make them ubiquitous. You can build an infrastructure that satisfies needs. 90% of the installations or more could be this lower cost level too. And we'd still keep the EV driver moving. We keep their, their vehicles charged. They will charge when they need to. And we're not overbuilding. Um, we need to, the other part of this study was we need to know how many chargers we need. And the global standard that they used was to avoid congestion in a market, you want to have about 10, 11 vehicles per charger. So if you have 18 million EVs on the road in 2030, you need 1.8 million chargers. The federal government's trying to build out 500,000. Now, they're trying to build out DC fast chargers. That's much more expensive. And I get it. If you're on the road, you want to charge to get going. But if we build a whole series of level two chargers strategically at the grocery store, at the school, at the gym, at the points of interest, at restaurants, at shopping malls, where people go and they can plug in every time they go, it's not draining your battery and recharging to 100%. It's adding 30, 40 miles in an hour. Because you're going to be there and you drove 20 miles to get there. So you replenish that 20 miles. You get home, you replenish the other 20 miles. And constantly replenishing the miles we drive with a lower cost infrastructure, the ROI starts to really make a lot of sense. And I think there's a lot of value to that. And level two doesn't fit everything. It doesn't fit Mm -hmm. all the needs. It doesn't fit the convenience store model at all. So you need a big chunk of DC fast chargers, but let's do them appropriately. Let's put them where they need to be. And let's not overbuild and waste resources when we do this. You, you raised an excellent, excellent point there in thinking about convenience retailers listening to this podcast. They'd, they'd be saying, well, you know, that, that doesn't sound like it necessarily benefits me. But it does when you, when you think about it in that some of these charges that take a longer period of time, you don't want that person on your lot anyway. If somebody's going to a mall for four hours, let them charge. And it's almost like thinking about the introduction of pay at the pump in the mid 80s. Uh, There was a lot of concern at the time that if we offer pay at the pump, then people may not go inside the store and you'll actually lose sales because you're you're so convenient that people won't come inside. And as we know, the opposite happened. Those that just wanted to get gas went and got gas and they went on their way. But the real opportunity came in that somebody that wanted to buy a cup of coffee didn't have to wait behind three people that were paying for their gas. So it created a new opportunity to, to grow that in-store sale. So I would imagine that we'll find some of these opportunities here for convenience retailers who have charging that have fast chargers for some of these level two chargers. They're taking away some of the, the lingering charges and, and we'll find these things as, as this develops over the next decade. Yeah, you know, the DC fast charge is the great model for the convenience industry because you can plug in for 10 to 15 minutes and get a meaningful charge. Um, and that's where the industry needs to be there. The industry has built its reputation. We're there when you need us. Now, if I have an EV and I forget to plug in at night and I got a long drive the next morning and I don't have enough charge, I'm panicked. I'm going to think I got to go to the convenience store to get or gas station to charge. You want to have that service for them. Or there's a power outage at my house. I need to recharge the next day. I need... I need miles. I need them fast. I can't wait for level two. That's the ni- the niche that the convenience industry is going to satisfy. And you have to be there. The other thing we're going to satisfy for the convenience industry is I'm going out to grab some lunch. I have my choice between restaurant A, restaurant B, fast food, whatever. One has a charger. I, you know what? I don't have a charger at the office. I can replenish what I drove to the office and plug in while I'm eating. I'll go there because the other store doesn't have it. And so you start getting this competitive situation where you're capturing that opportunity charge as well as the desperation fast charge. Um, It's really important. The other thing that we're working on and thinking about doing is trying to do a public education campaign to help consumers understand what to expect when they plug in at a public charger. Because we're hearing some horror stories that they plug into a charge that's 150 kilowatts and they're not getting 150 kilowatts. They go inside the store and they, they scream at the clerk. Clerk's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, I mean, that's not even ours. We, we contacted out to a third party. The vehicle determines how fast you charge. That charger may be trying to give you 150 kilowatts, but if you're at 80%, your vehicle's not going to accept it. If your battery's hot, your vehicle's not going to accept it. If, you're va- if your battery's not configured to accept 150 kilowatts, guess what? You're not going to get it. 
And so helping people understand what that experience should be and what influences it is something that we hope to be able to, to bring to market in the next year or so. And, and of course, another thing to look at is is the the, the condition of chargers. Uh, you, we've all seen pictures of chargers, and, and you know, there are people that treat chargers the way uh, people used to treat air hoses. Um, and it's uh, you know it's it's a it's a tough world to be an air hose, and it's a tough world to be a charger um, in some c- cases where um, they don't last long, and they are sensitive. They are sensitive electronic pieces. And you can't run them over and expect them to work. Right. We have to maintain them. We have to maintain them physically. We have to maintain their software. And if you don't do that, there's a couple of companies out there that I haven't been engaged with that their whole business is about maintenance and uptime. There's a requirement in the NEBI program. You have to report your uptime. And the goal is 98% up. That means operational. Um, when you pull into a gas station and the, and the nozzles are bagged, you, the the despair that fills you because you're on two miles to go. It's like, oh man, same thing with the charger. You pull into a charger and it's not working. Yeah. The difference is typically there's another gas station across the street. Mm-hmm. We yeah, are not at one. the point where there's another DC fast charger across the street. And so making sure that you're servicing the customer when they need it and how they need it is so important. Yeah, and and you can't really carry around a, a jug looking for electrons to to charge it back up. <laughs> now, um, the 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 beauty of what the Fuels Institute does with reports is it adds clarity to a market, and it's nonpartisan. It's not biased. It is designed, uh, and I, I love the way you frame that. It, it's so we are as efficient with government money, everybody's money as possible. So you built out this report, and every every time somebody puts together a report, the idea is to learn something or to confirm something. Was there anything in this that, that absolutely surprised you? And was there anything in this that you found gratifying that, okay, we need this, we need to uh, get this point home as much as possible. This is important. Research validates it. Couple things that surprised me. Um, I really expected the geographic distribution of electric vehicles to be more balanced by 2030. I did not expect 76% concentration in 15 states to still be the nature of the market. Um, so that was a little surprising. I was also really surprised that we may be able to satisfy most of our charging needs with level two. Um, when I when we started the Electric Vehicle Council a couple years ago. My mind was DC fast charger everywhere. Level two is a waste of time, waste of resources. Nobody's going to spend the time doing that. But I was thinking in a gasoline refuel model mindset, that's not the mindset of an EV driver. An EV driver is there's a charger and they plug in. I have a plug-in hybrid. I only get 25 miles of electric. But if I see a plug-in that I can use, I use it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have to reset how we think about the way the driver is going to be thinking about their energy needs. They're not going to let it go down to empty. And you you may never even get it above 80% because once you get past 80% state of charge, this this charge rate drops precipitously. Those were two things that surprised me. The gratifying that came out of this was there is a opportunity here to develop a strategy that serves the market well, that can be economically responsible. And if we focus on a needs-based analysis and a needs-based approach to market development, then everybody can win. It's this mindset that we need chargers in every location and every state right now, that's a failed strategy. And that's going to create such a disincentive to investment that you're going to have chargers sitting out there that are going to basically age out before a single vehicle comes by. Or you're going to have chargers in a market where you don't have enough chargers because we diverted resources to a, a no EV market and the market that has a whole bunch of growth mm-hmm. doesn't have the resources to satisfy it. So we prioritize what S&P did is they took that census tract data and they analyzed and prioritized states into one of four categories, high priority down to lower priority based upon 
How many EVs are they going to have in the next 10 years? How many EV chargers are they likely to have? What's the housing complex? What's the demand for chargers? And let's prioritize our investment to satisfy needs as it needs to develop. And so you don't overinvest in a market that doesn't need it. And you don't underinvest in a market that absolutely needs it. We really just need to be that strategic about it. Um, so that was really what I hoped to get out of this. And I think we really did a good job. And I talked to a guy a couple of days ago who says, the prioritization in your study is very different from my prioritization. I said, well, there's no guarantees. There's no exact science here. There's no, this is the methodology that is 100% lock tight sure. It's another data point to help us really think about how we go about this and use you know, his prioritization, our prioritization other, to figure out what makes the most sense. Again, I can't well, stress it enough. Nobody knows the future. No matter how much they want to tell you, no matter how much they charge you for the research they do, they don't know. They're guessing. They may be pretty good at guessing, but they're guessing. Mm-hmm. And so you need to acu- aggregate a whole bunch of guesses to figure out what might make sense. And uh, we're going to be aggregating some more data and research next. And the Fuels Institute is working together for the next show with there's some general session discussion. There's some education uh, session discussion. Um, so if you haven't already registered for the next show, uh, October 1 through 4 in Las Vegas, it's a pretty good time. It's a good learning opportunity. And, and John, where can people get more about this report and other information related to the Fuels Institute? Yeah, all of our research is open to the public, free of charge. Uh, you can download it at fuelsinstitute.org. Um, when you go there, you click on the research you're interested in. There's not just the research, there's executive summaries, there's some slides and videos, blogs, podcasts, relevant information all put together in one spot. So if you're interested in EVSE deployment, we're going to have a whole bunch of resources on one page for you to a leaf through. Data points to figure out the future. Thank you, John Eichberger. As always, uh, nice talking to you. And thank you all for listening to Convenience Matters. If you aren't already, feel free to subscribe and join us weekly. Till the next time, thanks for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by NAX and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.